OK, we need to talk about the pound, which, despite what you might have heard, has not been pegged to the stablecoin tether. The UK has been facing a cost of living crisis, which was a problem before the war in Ukraine and has only gotten worse since, in particular due to the huge spike in energy prices. The new British Prime Minister, Liz Truss, who assumed office a few weeks ago, has promised to be bold and to do things differently. Upon her appointment, she put in place an energy price guarantee to limit the amount that suppliers can charge customers for gas and electricity. The plan is that the average British family will save £1,000 a year based on current energy prices. £1,000 converts into a bit over $1,000. The price guarantee is to be funded through borrowing, and according to the Institute for Fiscal Studies, the two-year energy package is likely to cost £100 billion, or 4% of GDP, in the first year alone. Its total cost might be £150 billion, or dollars or tethers. The Bank of England's chief economist said at the time that the extra government borrowing and spending would likely lead to higher interest rates in the future. Investors sold UK assets earlier this month after this announcement, sending the pound down against the dollar, which reached its weakest level since 1985. Something did have to be done about high UK energy prices, in particular because energy prices make up a very high percentage of the costs of the most vulnerable in society. So there's a good argument that any support should have been targeted to reach those who are suffering the most through energy inflation. Possibly offering means-tested support would have made the overall package a lot cheaper, and the economy would have been better able to sustain such a package should the current high prices drag on longer than is expected. Manoj Pradhan and Charles Goodhart at Talking Heads Macro estimate that this support package benefits the wealthy in the UK two to three times as much as it benefits the poor. So maybe it's not as well designed as it could have been. On top of this, high prices send an important economic signal to consumers, encouraging them to cut back on consumption when prices are high. A broad-based price freeze like this mutes that signal, meaning that those who can still afford the high energy prices are less likely to cut back on consumption than they might otherwise be. So the pound began declining again on Friday and over the weekend, reaching its lowest level ever against the US dollar today. This decline came after the announcement of Quasi Quartang's £45 billion tax cut package on Friday. The tax cuts were put in place with the goal of boosting economic growth. The slide in the value of the pound prompted numerous jokes comparing the pound to an emerging market currency. We'll talk in just a moment about why the idea of a looming EM-style sterling crisis doesn't make an awful lot of sense at present. A declining pound, I should first note, is not a new thing. The pound has been falling against the US dollar ever since the end of the Second World War, when the pound was worth around $4. The reason for this consistent depreciation is just that the UK inflation rate has been persistently higher than US inflation over that period, and the exchange rate had to fall in order to equalise price levels in the two economies. The recent fall in the pound is driven by investors selling British assets because they have doubts about the soundness of the government's plans. This is driven by concerns about the British economy rather than just being related to dollar strength. The pound has fallen by more than 7% against the currencies of Britain's international trade partners since the start of August. 
From a market's perspective, the tax cuts combined with increased government spending at a time like this is what's causing the slide. Economists probably wouldn't recommend these actions, but they appeal to politicians in the same way that releasing oil from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve might appeal in the United States. It gives voters the feeling that politicians are doing something for them in a time of high inflation close to elections. The reason that stimulating the economy with tax cuts might not make sense in the UK right now is that the UK unemployment rate is very low at present and there's very little spare capacity in the economy for non-inflationary growth. Spare capacity in economics describes the extent to which an economy is operating below the maximum sustainable level of production. Spare capacity depends on the balance of demand for goods and services relative to the economy's ability to produce those goods and services. When there's not enough demand, you see spare capacity, which puts downward pressure on inflation. If there's too much demand, this results in capacity being constrained and you see upward pressure on inflation. A key indicator of how much spare capacity exists in an economy is the unemployment rate. A high unemployment rate means that there's a large pool of workers willing to work but not engaged in production, which suggests that the economy is operating below its potential. In such a situation, economic stimulus can cause businesses to hire more people, stimulating demand without causing inflation, which is a positive outcome. The rate of unemployment that's in line with an economy producing close to its potential is associated with a stable rate of inflation. So it's known as the non-accelerating inflation rate of unemployment. When unemployment deviates from this level, it suggests that the economy is producing either above or below its prevailing potential. The tax cuts in the UK when unemployment is very low as it is right now and inflation is a problem is likely to just push inflation even higher. The decline in the pound's value that we've just seen is also likely to be inflationary. So none of this does anything to help the UK's inflation rate or cut into the cost of living crisis. Trading in the pound was the most volatile we've seen since the start of the pandemic in early 2020. The currency swung more than 5% from its daily high and low points today. In a statement on Twitter, the Bank of England said that it was monitoring developments and would not hesitate to change interest rates by as much as is needed to return inflation to the 2% target. And the UK Chancellor Kwasi Kwarteng, in an attempt to reassure markets that he's serious about bringing debt under control, announced that he was bringing forward plans to publish a new medium-term fiscal strategy to November 23rd. Previously, he had not been expected to announce his new debt strategy until the new year. The Bank of England's announcement that they would not assess the turbulence in financial assets until their next planned meeting in November reduced the probability of any emergency rate hike to traders. This was likely the reason that the pound fell to under a dollar and seven cents from its high on the day of a dollar and nine cents. Markets are currently expecting the Bank of England to raise rates to over 5% next year and the cost of government borrowing has increased. 10-year borrowing costs have risen from just over 1% at the start of the year to over 4% today. The Bank of England had just raised interest rates by half of a percent on Thursday after a third success of 75 basis point rate increase by the US Federal Reserve a day earlier. Manoj Pradhan at Talking Heads Macro says that a ratings downgrade by credit rating agencies looks increasingly likely given the events of the last few days, but is not being discussed at all in the press. 
He says that a downgrade would probably not have much impact on market pricing, but it would put significant political pressure on the Conservative government. He says that there are two possible paths and that both look extremely difficult. The first path is that the Truss administration could decide to just ride through the market storm, ignore foreign exchange weakness and hope that the Bank of England can stabilise the pound. He says that the can won't get kicked very far down the road with such a strategy. An emergency 100 or 150 basis point increase in policy rates on top of what was priced in before the tax cuts could help satisfy markets and bring some stability to the pound. But that would make economic and thus market conditions much worse in the future. An increase in policy rates of that magnitude, when the level of debt is so high, would mean an even higher deficit in the future. That would happen for two reasons. First, it would more than reverse the entire benefit of the fiscal expansion. And second, the interest expense would rise due to the higher interest rates and the higher level of debt in the economy. The second path that Minot says could happen is that a politically embarrassing backtracking occurs. He argues that backtracking towards a more conservative fiscal stance would likely be more popular amongst conservatives in Parliament, but it would hand an embarrassing political victory to the Labour Party. He argues that backtracking like this has the potential to take the new administration down and plunge the UK into another search for Prime Minister. Okay, so I mentioned earlier that it's not reasonable to expect an emerging market-style currency crisis in the UK. There's a very good Reinhardt and Rogoff paper on how these things work, but typically there are two ways that a country with a floating exchange rate can have a currency crisis, and neither applies to the UK at present. Usually a currency crisis happens when a country has large external liabilities that are denominated in a foreign currency. As the home currency depreciates, the debts grow. This creates a self-reinforcing downward spiral. The UK does have a lot of external liabilities, but they're mostly British pound denominated. The UK also has external assets, mostly direct investments abroad. For these assets, currency depreciation is actually good for the UK, so a currency crisis of this sort doesn't seem likely. Now, the other way you can have a currency crisis is if a substantial percentage of a country's debt is held by international investors who lose faith in either the country's ability or its willingness to service that debt. But the Independent Bank of England is unlikely to monetize debt like that, and additionally, UK debt isn't that large by long-run standards. So once again, unlikely. Now, I know that a lot of my viewers are based in the United States, so how might this affect you? Well, the president of the Atlanta branch of the Federal Reserve announced a few hours ago that the UK government's new fiscal plan has increased economic uncertainty and raised the odds of a global recession. He said that a basic tenet of economics is more uncertainty leads to less engagement by consumers and businesses. He went on to say the key question will be what does this mean for ultimately weakening the European economy, which is an important consideration for how the US economy is going to perform. If you enjoyed this video, you should watch this one next. Have a great day and talk to you again soon. Bye.